Hey everyone, this is Ryan Roy of Tanadrine Studios. This video will be the first of a series which I'm calling the Developer's Diary. In each periodical video, I will outline my experiences, trials, and frustrations that I face when developing animated projects. It'll also provide an inside look into content that I'm currently working on, which can be nice considering that many of my compilations typically take at a minimum three weeks to complete or longer, assuming a part-time animation schedule. Just to put things on record, the software packages I currently use to create my videos are outlined here. Okay, here we go. June 21st, 2010. Developer's Diary number one. So what is Tanadrine Studios anyways? Right now, it's just the name to call the cumulative skills that Taven and I possess. Oh, I'm sorry, wrong picture. We don't really have a well-established website yet, and that probably won't be a priority until we have more content under our belts. A lot of you may look at the upload date of my last video, Connor's Adventures in Dareth, Episode 4, and think I've been on hiatus. From my end of the line, this just isn't true. I've been spending a lot of time experimenting and researching some of the other features from Lightwave and attempting to master them with mixed degrees of success. One major positive discovery I've made is the usage of a feature that Lightwave calls IK Booster. It's a feature I've ignored because I really wanted to produce some animations and the initial process of learning the fundamentals had left me feeling pretty impatient and eager to make something meaningful and worth watching. To show you just how much of a difference this makes, I previously controlled my character's arms by utilizing two controllers on their elbows and hand and moving them accordingly, one at a time. Although this setup is fairly flexible, its major weakness is the wrist problem which has plagued me since I started using this setup. Basically some movements would cause the character's lower arm to rotate or snap upside down and in turn forcing the hand to be upside down or backwards. Since most of the characters I create have simplistic lower arm textures, it's not very noticeable and I typically just compensate for this by rotating as needed. Another problem is certain arm movements being a real pain to set up, especially for complex movements. Take for example that I want a character's arm to be like this. Well, I would have to carefully maneuver the points and make extra frames in such a way that the arm wouldn't bend backwards or do something wrong in the process. IK Booster, on the other hand, eliminates all of these problems and adds some valuable tools that I can use to my advantage. I can now create things like tails and rope-like objects and animate them pretty easily. More importantly, however, is that I can move a character's entire upper body with only one controller, and I have much more flexibility in how it all works. I don't have to worry about where my controllers are either, as I'm moving the bones themselves rather than unattached controllers. If I only want the arm to move and the body to stay still, I can just fix the shoulder and it's done. I don't even have to bother setting up inverse chromatics initially, which is really nice. I still use regular inverse chromatics for the legs, however, because foot placement, i found, demands much more precise control than IK Booster really offers. In summary, it's a huge time saver and a big step in simplifying my animation process. Unfortunately, I'm still struggling with some of the other features of Lightwave, and I haven't made much headway. Cloth effects is one of those tools. I had absolutely no luck getting this to work predictably and reliably. I thought this would be a really nice option to retain the simplicity of my non-organic models while eliminating the jointed look by concealing it. Even following all of the instructions I've been able to find and experimenting with many different ways for countless hours, nothing usable on a character model has resulted, but at least I can still use it for props and maybe even some special effects. Hard effects looks pretty promising. I can definitely see myself making some destructive environments such as this, though my initial results don't look quite right. Uh, like, for example, these bricks here don't really have much rotation to them upon impact, and it makes it look really cheesy. Making avalanches and stuff with physics, though, seems like it's much easier to achieve now, so that's pretty cool. UV mapping is a process that basically flattens the polygons in a way that you can texture them seamlessly much easier than you would by selecting polygons manually and assigning them a specific surface property, such as a texture. 
I've wanted to master UV mapping for a while now, but nothing I seem to do seems to work, and I can't really get a good grasp on it. The documentation and videos that I've read and have been able to get don't really help me specifically. It's really holding me back to not know how to do this properly, but it'll have to be an ongoing thing to stab at repeatedly until something sinks in. For now, I'm just going to texture things in my usual fashion. It's not optimal, but at least it works. So that leaves us with our current projects. As of this video, all of my past 3D projects are consistent of the Connors Adventures and Dareth series. This series has been an excellent jumpstart to my 3D animation learning process, and it's something I really enjoy creating, too. Right now, I'm up to episode 5, which is about 40% done, give or take. I've put the series on pause, however, for the meantime, because I'm really itching to create something that's completely original and from our own ideas. Connor's Adventures in Dareth uses model references and textures directly from the game of Asheron's Call. It's also not something that we would be able to sell for any amount of money due to copyright issues. For fans of the series, don't take this the wrong way. Connor's Adventures will continue, so just have patience about it. So what the heck is this new project anyways? I can't give too many details right now, but I'm in the process of making a test animation of sorts which will serve as a catalyst for a new fantasy sci-fi series both me and Tabin are jointly working on. Tabin hasn't done any 3D work before, so he has a lot to catch up on. At the very least, though, he has the benefit of actually being able to ask for help, which is something I would have liked. Initially, I wanted to use high-detailed, sub-patched characters, but I quickly found that it complicates not only the modeling process, but the animation process as well. You have much longer rendering times, a crippled preview while animating, or at least on my computer, and you have to worry much more about proper deforming by the use of complex weight maps. To put it simply, it's way over our heads both skills and resources wise. And I personally believe that you don't really need overly souped up models and backgrounds to create something that's entertaining and meaningful to watch. This is why I always want to place higher emphasis on the quality of animation so that my characters can still convey movement and emotion believably. From all the 3D videos that I've watched for inspiration and studied that are done by other people, I find it difficult to believe that people in general don't understand a simple concept. If your animation is not on par with your modeling skills, it completely trashes whatever you decide to make that isn't just a single image. An animation error in surrealistic models is much, much more noticeable, probable, and jarring than if you use a more simplistic means of creating content. That said, my belief in how animation should be done enables me to produce much more content in a shorter amount of time than I would be able to otherwise. Anyways, back to the subject on hand. Uh, there are a few firsts that I'm delving into with this project. While I'm still using non-organic models, I created this one with the intention of making it far more articulate in regards to the hands, feet, and face. So with this guy here, I can move each individual finger and each individual toe. I've also finally utilized what are called endomorphs, which are basically snapshots of geometry that a model can conform to gradually. Using this feature, I've set up facial expressions that my character can have, and it works surprisingly well even despite the guy's low polygon count. So that's pretty much all the time I have for developer's diary number one. As you can see, I still have a long way to go in regards to animation in general. There's still a ton of things that I need to learn and grasp, but I don't feel that's any reason to not have fun with it while creating it. 